Wealth, fame, power. I, living room renowned rules guy, could have attained that and everything else the world has to offer. If I wanted self-improvement, I could have had it. I had every bit of spare time that exists gathered in one place. I just had to find the motivation to do it. That possibility lured me to the television in pursuit of distractions greater than I had ever imagined. This was a time known as the Great Pirate Anime Binge Watch. Wanna know what I got out of it? Well then, climb aboard and bring along all your hopes and dreams. Together we'll find... There's rules for that. After weeks of getting away with the excuse that I simply didn't have the time, a global super flu that you may have heard of once or twice, and its associated interminable quarantine, finally persuaded me to acquiesce to Ricky's cheerfully forceful suggestion that I sit down and watch One Piece. So over the last three days, or years, or however long it's been since March, we did. And we caught up. And it's great. So to celebrate, today Terrific will be looking at not just one incredibly specific and questionably useful concept, but a whole bunch of them. Welcome to part one of our 996 part series in which we... Hmm? Our budget is what? Oh, we do not have a budget. At all. Okay. Welcome to part one of our two-part series, in which we recreate the Notorious Straw Hat Pirate Crew. These ten builds have been evenly split not only between 5th edition and Pathfinder, but also between this week's video and the next, so be sure to join us after the time skip for the rest. And we'll get started with the future Kaizoku no himself, Monkey D. Luffy in Pathfinder. To call this build a success, we need a PC that can A, stretch like rubber, B, rev their way through gears 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and C, have some semblance of something that reminds us of Conqueror's Hockey. And remarkably enough, we can accomplish all of that with just one class, Blood Rager. A somewhat bizarre mash between of Barbarian and Sorcerer, the Blood Rager is a full BAB class that gains special Bloodline benefits and 4 level spellcasting when they start raging. Luffy isn't particularly a wrathful guy exactly, but Oda help any poor villain in his way when he decides to buckle down and get serious. So I'm counting it. We'll be taking the Aberrant Bloodline, and while our real payoff is in a couple levels, the introductory ability Staggering Strike does a pretty mean impression of a gum gum pistol already. But yes, at level 5 we do pick up Abnormal Reach, which stretches our arms out 5 more feet when we Blood Rage. How about that? We'll also be taking the Bloody Knuckled Rowdy Archetype, which trades DR and some spells known for both improved unarmed strike and the scaling monk damage to go with it. Plus, it lets us grab a few style feats down the road. They're a little challenging to qualify for, but it's worth checking out Pummeling Style for a Gum Gum Gatling type attack, and as it happens, Monkey Style for the kind of mobility and bouncy resilience you'd expect from a rubber man. Last up, even though the Blood Rager has a pretty modest spell list, it is weirdly packed with on-theme options. If you aren't satisfied with our rubber action so far, you can also pick up Long Arm, Extreme Flexibility, and yes, a spell called Bouncy Body. On the topic of emulating Luffy's various gears, we have the ever classic Haste for Gear 2nd, Force Punch to stand in for Gear 3rd, and way up in the lofty heights of 4th level spells, Monstrous Physique 2 for Gear 4th. For our last checkbox, we're looking for some kind of forceful aura spread projectile will that leaves weaker foes trembling and incapacitated. We're looking for Conqueror's Hockey. And with just a smidgen of reflavoring, the 3rd level spell, Vision of Hell, should do a fine job. And we could do more but there's no time to linger. So on to the next straw hat, we go! Let's make Roro Noa Zoro, Pirate Hunter Emeritus in 5th edition. And what do we need in a fundamentally recognizable Zoro? Admittedly, our checklist is a little easier this time. He absolutely, positively must have sword. And I mean, that's really, oh no, wait, no, no! Not sword, swords. He must have swords, plural, swordses even, because he's gotta have three for his signature Santorio style. So we're looking for someone who can A, make three sword attacks per turn, B, withstand some serious, serious punishment from flamboyant Catholics and evil soap scum alike, and C, fire off a couple of particularly distinctive sword techniques. The good news is that for the second time in as many characters, we'll be keeping this build to only a single class. In this case, Fighter. We'll prioritize strength over all else. I mean, have you seen this guy's gym routine? With as much con as we can afford to invest in after that. As usual, we will be a variant human for an extra feat. For this first one, we should take a dual wielder so that it is actually legal to attack with all of our swords. That seems like a good start. Similarly, we should also take the two weapon fighting style to keep our damage up and even. So that's one normal attack and one two weapon fighting attack. That means that once we get our extra attack at level five, we've got our three sword attacks per turn in the bag. Now, technically, of course, that's two hits with one sword and one with the other, instead of properly hitting one time with each of three swords. But I bet if you ask real nicely, your DM will let you get that last hit in with your weird mouth sword. First box, check. For our subclass, we are obviously taking guns. No, we're taking samurai, baby. Right out of the gate, fighting spirit keeps us always hitting and always healthy, as any respectable greatest swordsman in the world in training should be. Moreover, far enough down the line, 15 levels down the line to be exact, we'll be able to sacrifice those advantage rolls to hit, get this, a fourth time with Rapid Strike. Even a little more down the line, at level 18, we pick up Strength Before Death, which gives us an extra turn of actions before hitting zero HP before we pass out. And if you're playing Zoro the way that Zoro would, that should be plenty of time to stoically stabilize enough to convince everyone around that nothing 
happened. And hey, between that and the temp HP from Fighting Spirit earlier, not to mention our huge con focus, we can call item B in our checklist fulfilled. Now, how about some of those signature sword techniques? For our first feat after Dual Wielder, let's pick up Martial Adept, a feat that lets us poach a couple maneuvers from the Battlemaster subclass. Personally, I feel like Lunging Attack is our best candidate to act as Zoro's bread and butter Onigiri Slash, and Sweeping Attack reminds us that Zoro does particularly well when surrounded and pressed on all sides. This is getting pretty close to recognizably Mr. Bushido, but the thing that'll really cement our imitation is some kind of way to participate in the time-honored samurai tradition of launching laser beams out of our blade. That is, how do we 108 caliber phoenix? The truth is, there's nothing quite like that just sitting around for us. Ah, but since we are a master swordsman, surely that means we deserve a masterfully made sword. Yes? To hit our third of three checklist goals, let's dive deep into the DMG's rules for magic item creation and forge Zoro's prized katana, Wadoichi Manji. This is a legendary plus three magic longsword that requires attunement and has stored within it two charges of the ability 108 Galibur Phoenix. After using an action to activate, all creatures in a 100 foot line are subject to 10 d6 of slashing damage that can be halved on a dc15 deck save. To regain those charges, you must perform a three hour morning workout intense enough to prevent you from preparing any other spells or such for that day. Now that's a sword. Just uh, be careful with it around stairs. You don't want to put an eye out. Now, going right along our merry way, next up we have the bravest warrior the sea has ever produced and I know that's true because he told me himself. Usopp, long of shots and even longer of nose in a 5th edition build. And what are our stand-up traits for this stand-up guy? We need someone who's both A, a ranged shot extraordinaire with not only the distance of a sniper but the utility of a Batman, and B, so daringly bold but deceitful that he is both wanted and admired under multiple false identities. Our first checkbox is relatively straightforward to fill. The entirety of the Arcane Archer Fighter subclass is designed pretty much for exactly this. By the time we're level 7, we have access to Bursting Arrow, aka Gunpowder Star, Shadow Arrow, which will incapacitate our enemy's sense of sight not unlike, say, a Tabasco Star, and Grasping Arrow, which erupts into catching thorns and brambles in exactly the same way that Usopp's post Time skip pop greens do. To fine tune in on the observation hockey that makes Usopp's sniping arsenal so effective, we can take the sharpshooter feat. If we keep going a few more levels into Arcane Archer, we can pay homage to Usopp's legendary distance work in Dressrosa with Seeking Arrow as well. But of course, sniping is only half of what makes an Usopp an Usopp. You see, there's no need to stay far, far away from combat if there's simply no combat to begin with. And how do we convince people not to violence us when, let's face it, we probably deserve to be violenced? Why, by lying, of course! Let's take the everybody's friend feat to give us proficiency in deception and persuasion. Now, of course, the real value in this feat comes from using it to double the proficiency bonus that you already had because you were already proficient in deception or persuasion. But alas, as a mere fighter, we are not. You know who is, though? Sniper King! By taking the Demir operative background from the Guilds of Ravnica sourcebook, we can assume a false identity that will keep the Marines scrambling to find just where it is we're hiding when we've already slipped back into the world and run away to lie another day. Oh, and right, that does set us up to have an existing deception proficiency, so double it up. Next up on our Mugiwara no menu is that stone-cold lady killer of a cook, Sanji. Except, actually, now that I say that, he's not either of those things, is he? I mean, quite to the contrary, he's so very much the opposite of Stone Cold or a killer of ladies that those are the two things that make up our checklist. We need a Pathfinder PC that A, can kick fast enough to set the air itself on fire, and B, wouldn't hurt a woman if his or anyone else's life depended on it. Now, to that first point, if you've ever thought about making a character like Sanji who is 100% dedicated to kicking, kicking, and only kicking, I would punk hazard a guess that you, like I, probably thought about using the Monk or the Brawler. But I have dismissed such easy and probably correct solutions for a far less necessary and far more fun one, an elemental ascetic pyrokineticist. I won't dive too deep on how exactly the kineticist works here and now because, hey, I already made that video. Check it out. Suffice to say, choosing fire as your element is a good start here. The archetype I mentioned, the Elemental Ascetic, locks us into using close-range form infusions with our Kinetic Blast in exchange for free access to the Kinetic Fist Infusion with a reduced burn of zero, improved unarmed strike, and the Monk's Flurry of Blows ability. Pretty good deal, I'd say. Now, first sticking point. The archetype ability calls out super, super specifically that you can only use it to flurry with your fists, no matter what else you got going on from any other ability anywhere. That's obviously a problem, since Sanji is even more reluctant to use his hands for fighting than he is to respond the personal space and boundaries of the women around him. Like seriously man, chill it. For real. But hopefully your GM will allow you to rule zero that into the word feet and then you're all good. Kinetic fist or foot, kinetic foot, means that every attack gets to be a diable de jambe and that is super neat. Also super neat, by taking the Stylish Infusion Wild Talent, you can pick up various style strikes from the Unchained Monk to throw into your Fire Flurries. I'd suggest looking at Knockback Kick, Spin Kick, and Leg Sweep. And to eke one last little bit of utility out of these Kineticist levels, the Utility Talents Flame Jet and Greater Flame Jet actually end up working exactly like Sanji's post time skip moonwalking. And of course, we wouldn't really be Sanji without a healthy, mm, maybe even unhealthy, dollop of chivalry, right? To represent that, I'll point to one of my favorite one to two level dips in all of the Pathfinder rule system, a somewhat obscure prestige class called Chevalier. Side note, 
It is obscure because, technically speaking, it's actually content from way back in Paizo's early days when they made Adventure Paths for 3.5, so make sure to clear it with your GM first. To class into Chevalier, all you need is a BAB of 6, one rank in both Diplomacy and Knowledge Local, and to have at some point performed a true act of heroism, which is probably to say something that was in equal parts very brave, very admirable, and very stupid. But just in the first level alone, you pick up an aura of courage that makes you completely immune to fear effects, a la Paladin, and an ability called Recklessness that gives a boost for dynamically powering your way into combat without ever looking back. It's a good fit, I think. The other two levels of the class aren't bad either, so check them out. That checks both of our checklist goals, but here's one last thing. Deep in the furthest recesses of the cavernous index of ultimate equipment, there exists a mithril waffle iron. Sure, it may cost 2,500 times more than a common waffle iron, but it's twice as light and non-stick. So worth it. Has any character ever deserved it more? And hey, speaking of mind-bogglingly valuable and easily thievable items, our last straw hat today, also in a Pathfinder build, is the less than semi-retired cat burglar and more than semi-professional accountant, Nami. Once again, we've got three fundamental characteristics to hit. A, we've gotta pay homage to the decade of her life that she spent plundering and thieving treasure to try and buy her village back from Arlong. B, we've gotta incorporate her skill at weather manipulation and people bonking via the climate attack. And C, We've got to acknowledge her professional roles as the crew's combination navigator and accountant. And I gotta admit, with such a varied and wide-ranging set of goals to aim for, I did not expect this concept to fall together as incredibly elegantly as it did. But check this out. We'll make an unchained rogue who uses feats and the bonuses provided by a special arcane compass to bump her use magic device skill high enough to activate various magical staves that will let her manipulate lightning, illusions, and the weather itself. Neat, right? I think it's neat. The rundown is really pretty straightforward. For feats, we'll take magical aptitude and skill focus UMD, which puts us at plus five. Adding a modest estimate of a plus three cha and our trained class skill bonus of another plus three, we've got a UMD of plus 11 before we even start counting skill ranks. Not bad, but we can bump it up just a tad more. There's a class of wondrous items called Wayfinders, magical compasses that are the signature symbol of one Pathfinder society. Yep, they're basically just log poses. How convenient is that? Moreover, they have spaces inside to slot special floating crystals called Iune Stones. There's a whole nother video right there, but for now, it's enough to just note that with both a cracked pink and green sphere and a mossy disc slotted in, we can get another plus one to both UMD and appraise. The actual Wayfinder itself is pretty neat too. A smuggler's Wayfinder specifically opens a small extra dimensional space sized perfectly for storing, say, a magical staff. Speaking of, our Nami will tote around three magical staffs. A staff of illusion for mirage tempo, a staff of electricity for thunder tempo, and a staff of weather for weather stuff. There is a small issue of not having any way to recharge these staffs, but you know what? We're in charge of the checkbook for an entire crew of pirates. When we run out of charges, we'll just buy ourselves a new one. With one staff in the Wayfinder and one staff on her back as normal, she'll still need a way to carry the third. Taking inspiration from her absolutely kickin' post time skip berry belt, we can pick up a security belt that lets us shrink and store it on command. That's the last of our East Blue crewmates, but worry not. As is literally always the case with One Piece, there is more yet to come. In fact, there is so much more to just these builds that it didn't all fit. Check out a few more custom-made magic items that didn't make the cut in the PDF below. Next video, we'll be going over Straw Hats from the Grand Line and beyond. So stay adventurin', and see you in the new world. Ta -da. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. We'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, DiceDungeons.com. They've got some super cool stuff, so go check it out. My personal favorite thing are these dice chests. They hold dice just like this. It's uh, super secure, they fasten on with magnets. They are super, super slick looking. I love them. Go check them out. Use the code DOORMONSTER at checkout to get 10% off your order, and uh, tell them, tell them we sent you, because we did. Howdy folks, this is the part at the end of the video where I comment on the, not just the end of the last video, but also the, the, all, the all of the last video and what, what you told me about the whole last video, which in this case was Spooky Scary Skellerog, which first off, many of you suggested better puns for, and you're right, like Skullduggery or Scalawag or literally anything but Skellerog. There's a lot of really great suggestions for other things and feats to in increase this Intimidate build. The first thing that people say a lot of is Shattered Defenses. Yes, absolutely pick up Shattered Defenses. That's, that's definitely a great one to add. I totally forgot about Anti-Paladin. I just never actually look at Anti-Paladin for everything, but um, there's apparently just a bunch of fear-based abilities in the, as, as part of the class, and if you're running an evil campaign, absolutely. I had a character who played a Hell Knight very effectively, which is like sort of a Dark Paladin, and but they don't necessarily have to be evil, because they just really have to like, like, there's a certain kind of Hell Knight that just really loves killing devils, and they're not bad people, they just hate devils. Um, and that's also a really great uh, Intimidate build. Oh well, yeah, the Anti-Paladin and the uh, Shadow Defenses adding to the Rogue is really great. There's a couple of uh, great Necromancer builds. I'm really excited to read through those a little bit better because I've never done a Necromancer build. I think that's um, a pretty good spooky thing to do. To the person who said, I have why, asked why my glasses are moist. I wish 
You hadn't asked that because now I'm also wondering why my glasses were moist. I don't have an answer, and I or I, I refuse to answer. Uh, somebody asked, uh, how exactly the hell I know about Fargo, and I know about it the same way everybody does. I went to a Latin convention there. 